What's crack? Big. Dokes. Welcome, bike, to the channel. Welcome, bike, to the headquarters. My name is Nicholas. This is BDGE. If you're not already subscribed to the channel, make sure you do so. It's a little button right underneath the video. Looks like a little YouTube button says subscribe on it. Really, 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 really hard to miss. You should do so because we're going to make you really good at fantasy football or we're going to give you your money back. Again, all your money, bike, if you're not good at fantasy football at the end of the summer. Coming out of Snacks as well, not mine. Not mine personally. But it is Tuesday, which means we are continuing down our Sloppy Seconds series, which is where we go ADP rank by ADP rank of every fantasy player in the sophomore class, okay? This was a dynamite class last year. So basically what we're doing is we're looking at the underdog ADP data, average draft position, looking at where these players are going in drafts right now, the running back and the wide receiver in the sophomore class. And each week we break down that respective ranking. So we've already done the running back one and the wide receiver one, the running back two and the wide receiver two, et cetera, et cetera. I believe this is the fifth episode of the series. Okay, so if you've missed any of the first four, it was Jonathan Taylor, it was Antonio Gibson, Cam Akers, CEH, and then vice versa, the, the wide receivers. So this video is going to be one running back, one wide receiver broken down in depth from the sophomore class. Because again, this is a dynamite class. Today's video, we'll be covering DeAndre Swiftly Shifty of the Detroit Lions, as well as Chase Claypool of the Pittsburgh Steelers. Two very, very polarizing players going into 2021 fantasy football. We're going to break down the pros. We're going to break down the cons. We're going to tell you what we like about them, what we don't like about them. And at the end of it, hopefully you're subscribed to the channel. Hopefully you hit the thumbs up button. If not, I don't really give a fuck. Tell you what, though. Shout out to me. I finished a book for the first time. I'm dirty this morning. It's like 8, 8 a.m. I already got black shit all over me. That's how you know we're working hard over here. Fuck it. I'll start tomorrow by Action Bronson. It was the first book from front to bike that I have finished in a long, long time. Not a reader. I just, I, my, uh, my attention span for reading just doesn't, doesn't happen. It's very hard for me to pay attention throughout the entirety of the book. I like to consume my content via podcasts and via videos as, as does most of the world as do you guys, obviously, since you're on here fucking watching my stupid face for, uh, for a minute. Uh, I, I would like to say I suggest the book. I love the book because I love Action Bronson and it reads just like he talks, which kind of reminds me of the way that I used to blog when I, when I blogged bike in the day, when I first started this fantasy football shit, I started off blogging and I hated writing but I would blog exactly how I talk. So if you listen to me right now and then you went to one of my old blog posts, it would sound exactly this way. It's pretty fucking embarrassing. Not a good writer. Action Bronson. So if you find Action Bronson funny, then this book will be funny for you. It's entertaining. It's pretty inspirational, especially towards the end of it. Not sure why the fuck I'm even bringing it up. I was just proud of myself for finishing a book. I'm fucking 28 years old and I'm proud of myself for finishing a book. Good job, Nick. All right. All right. All right. Let's give these some, uh, let's give, let's give these people something, something of value before we do so. Y'all know the fucking rules. We must tuck our shirts in. Stop yelling. Let's see. So all of the ADP data, 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 data that I reference throughout this video, throughout this entire series from underdog, it will be linked down below. Go download the app, use promo code BDGE. When you deposit 10 bucks, you're going to get 25 free dollars on top of that to play with. It is beautiful. And it's not going away anytime soon. So make sure you cop that ASAP. The ADP of Mr. DeAndre Swift, the Detroit Lions, is currently 28.6, running back 16. He is the fifth sophomore running back off the board, right? We have JT, we have Cam Akers, we have Antonio Gibson, we have Clyde edwards helaire and DeAndre Swift is the fifth running back in the sophomore class going off the board. Again, RB16, so he's a, a mid-tier RB2, and he's getting picked around halfway through the third round. Now, a lot of you guys are going to hear... RB16, well, that's his floor, all right? Here, listen, listen. The whole point of me coming onto the mic, every time I hit the record button, every time I turn the mic on and make sure that the sound is on, sometimes I forget to do the sound on, I do a whole fucking episode, then I gotta go bike and do it again, and that shit is it's the worst part about being a content creator. It's all the damn technology that you have the possibility of fucking up. Anyways, every time I turn the mic on, my goal is to shift your mindset. Realistically, my goal is not to actually convince you whether or not you should like a player. All right. I'm well aware that, you know, choosing between the RB15 and the RB16 when it's your draft pick, when you're up on the clock, it is a coin flip for you to get that right. I want you to think differently when it comes to drafting, when it comes to fantasy football, when it comes to fucking life in general. OK, the best content creators, in my opinions, are the ones that make you think differently at scale from a strategic standpoint. Right. Everyone can regurgitate the same shit, the same numbers, the same stats. But how many times you come across a podcast, you know, going into it, looking at something one way and coming out 
a completely different way. Like, damn, my whole ass mindset has been shifted. That's how that's how you start to appreciate content creators, right? The, the ones that I listen to, the ones that I appreciate are the ones that have made me think differently at scale. And those are the ones that I'll always support. And those are the ones that I'll always that I'll always follow, right? And I'll always listen to them, even if I don't agree with their takes. So that is my goal every time I step onto the mic. I know we're getting fucking emotional. But there's a point to this. This is where I'm leading. When you guys throw out the things like, oh, he's going at RB16. That is his floor. I mean, one, that's not true. But two, even if it was, that doesn't make him a good pick, DeAndre Swift, all right? The question you need to be asking as a fantasy football player, as a drafter, isn't what his floor is, but how likely he is not to finish around that floor, okay? If you say his floor is RB16 to RB18, out of 100% chance, what percentage is it that he finishes in that RB16 to RB18 range? Because if that rate is high, if you're like his floor is RB16 to RB18, RB15 to RB18, but there's a 75% chance that he, 75% chance that he actually finishes in that RB15 to RB18, that's not a good pick in fantasy football, okay? That doesn't move the needle. You don't want to be using your second, probably even your third round pick on someone that doesn't move the needles. We are solely, we are solely looking for needle movers. Okay. We draft two running backs off the rip. Typically that that's my strategy that I convey to you guys because hitting on high end running backs in fantasy, that is a needle mover. Okay. When you hit on a couple top 10, a couple top eight, a couple top six running backs in fantasy football, your team probably going to the chip, probably bringing back the hardware at a very basic level. That is what I mean. I cannot predict correctly who the high end running backs are going to be. We're going to try our best by looking at different fucking stats and big facts, but all else equal, we know that the data, then we know that the data will point to these types of strategies that move the needle for us. So you're looking at bigger picture always, and then break down your team that way when you're drafting. Okay. If we know high end RBs are the things that win championships for us, you should be focusing on those. And I say this all the time, diversify, the revenue. Okay. So if you're drafting in a bunch of different leagues, right. And your third round pick is on the clock. One draft, you go with Deandre Swift. One draft, you go with JK Dobbins. One draft, you go with fucking Keenan Allen. Okay. Because you don't know, you don't know who the players that are going to hit are going to be. None of us do. We're all right. We're all wrong about a whole bunch of shit. Okay. So that's what we talk about. You want to look at the overall strategy more so than the actual players themselves. So we look at last year, Kareem Hunt was the RB 18 in fantasy points per game. He averaged 12 and a half fantasy points per game and half PPR. Rex Burkhead averaged nine and a half fantasy points per game down at like running back 32. It's a three point difference per game. This is what I'm talking about. Like we talk about waiting to draft wide receivers because the difference between the high end wide receivers and like the middle wide receiver ones, wide receiver twos aren't that big on a points per game basis. They're not giving you that big of an advantage. So why waste high draft capital on it? The reason you want to use it on running backs is because the high end ones are a massive advantage in fantasy football. However, we don't talk about we don't talk enough about how middle to low end RB2s are not difference makers at all. They're really not difference makers when it comes to fantasy football. They are actually, despite popular belief, pretty, pretty replaceable. Point here, the point here, very much like the one I made in the CEH video, emphasizing things that just don't fucking matter and his 1,100 total yards from scrimmage is to stop fucking doing that. Stop choosing arbitrary numbers like his floor is RB17 and acting like that matters because RB17 doesn't do shit for you at the end of the season. My point here is not to say DeAndre Swift's floor is RB17 It's it, or his ceiling isn't the RB6 overall. It's just these stupid fucking buzz statements that people say, and it drives me fucking bonkers, okay? You know when I'm throwing out fucking English words at 9 a.m., We've got a problem. The big dog is big fucking mad. But let's look at Swift. Let's look at Swift. Here's what I'm talking about here. Here's what I'm, ta here's what I'm talking about. All of that preface, all that bullshit that I just spewed out of my face was to say the fate on DeAndre Swift has gone too far. It's gone too far. Yes, you didn't, you didn't think that was coming, did you? You didn't think that was coming. We look at Swift and we all love him as a, as a talent, great prospect, great running back. It looks like he's kind of going along the exact timeline Miles Sanders went through, right? Came in as a talented rookie. Everyone overdrafted him in redraft leagues, right? Fifth, sixth round because he's exciting. And we all just assumed that the talent was going to push him up the depth chart, even though it was clear that it wasn't going to happen based on the coach, based on the scheme that they were both drafted into, just like we had Jordan Howard, etc. in Philly. We had Adrian Peterson, Carrion Johnson in Detroit. The stage, however, for DeAndre Swift has been set in year two. And I made a, a video about DeAndre Swift, a couple weeks back. Now, it wasn't, it wasn't particularly just about DeAndre Swift, but it was my official fade list, my official do not draft list for running backs in 2021 fantasy football. That video will be linked 
down below. At the time I made the video, DeAndre Swift was going like 17 or 18 overall, I believe, somewhere in the second round, okay? It was like it was like mid-second, late second round, and at that price, can't get on board. Now he's dropping to the 29th, 30th pick, right? He's midway through the third round. I'm, I'm assuming he's going to keep dropping and dropping and dropping for whatever reason, but the more he drops, the more I like him, all right? And that, my friends again, is where I feel the fade has gone too far. Now, I'm going to be making a film soon about five players who I think the film, uh, the, the fade has gone too far on. And uh, again, Swift is going to be one of them. You're able to get basically him as your RB3. If you if you start with two running backs off the rip or the flex, you could, you could hypothetically start with like Saquon, Gibson, Swift, or Zeke, Antonio Gibson, or Zeke, CEH, Swift. And that shit is crispy, all right? Swift will be the starter this year. The point to take away with Swift here is that like Swift will be the starter in Detroit, but not every starter in the NFL is a workhorse. Swift won't be because Jamal Williams is there. He will absolutely play a, an annoying, an annoying number of snaps if you're a DeAndre Swift owner. Uh, the positives are, are obvious here, right? The lines are bad. They're going to have to throw a lot. Swift is a great pass catcher. Thus, he will have an advantage in that department. And they have such little talent at wide receiver that it might not even be hyperbole to project Swift as like the second leading target getter in this offense. I do think it's a stretch, to be honest. Anytime a running back is like the second leading target getter, very, very, very few running backs do that in fantasy football or just the NFL in general. But it's not impossible, right? People throw around huge target share numbers left and right when it comes to running backs without actually looking at the numbers and without actually understanding what the fuck they're talking about when they say these things. And uh, and it's not, then this tweet I'm about to bring up is not necessarily about just target share overall, but I tweeted this out last week and I figure it's worth showing y'all because again, we like to teach you strategy, not just players or numbers or anything like that. And, uh, and we hear this narrative all off season, right? My favorite narrative is the one where people think a backup running back is better than the starter. So they say, but he's going to be used in the slot this year. Okay. So you, you hear it all the time. Like, Oh, Tony Pollard. I love Tony Pollard. He's better than Zeke. Like one, no, he's fucking not. People like Tony Pollard so much or need to pretend that they like Tony Pollard so much that they're giving you fake reasons to draft him in fantasy football. Tony Pollard is the best 10th round pick in fantasy football. Like literally, no, it's not. You're going to sound dumb if Zeke stays healthy. If Zeke gets hurt, cool. Then you predicted an injury, which is like impossible to do. So you sound dumb otherwise. And they'll be like, well, Tony Pollard's going to be using the slot more this year. So he's a good draft pick. I went back and looked at last year, NFL running backs in 2020 that averaged three or more, literally three or more slot routes per game. I'm not talking about slot receptions. I'm not talking about slot targets. I'm talking about literally lining up in the slot to run a route. Three, just three per game, four NFL running backs did that. Four NFL running backs lined up in the slot three times per game. Okay. Do you understand how minimal that is? Look at Edmonds. J.D. McKissick, Malcolm Brown, that's why another reason I'm high on Cam Akers, and Alvin Kamara, okay? Like, none of them, Edmonds is the highest number at 5.6, 5.6 slot routes per game. Do you understand that running backs typically have like a 7 to 10% target share if they're in like the average or maybe a little bit above average? So you're talking about three slot routes per game, and you're targeted on what, 7 to 10% of your routes? So that's one slot target every four games. Like, what are we talking about here? Okay, it's just another fucking farce buzz term that people throw around that we need to debunk, debunk bed breakdown this shit, all right? Fucking skirt. Here's what we can reasonably expect. Like, what rate can we reasonably expect for a guy like DeAndre Swift? Now, people want to start throwing around like 15 to 20% target share. Let's start with the fact that Alvin Kamara was the only running back over the last year, or only running back in 2020 that clipped 20% in terms of target share on his respective team. And that was because Michael Thomas was basically dead. All right. Five running backs in the NFL went over 15% last year. I think 12 ish to 15% is, is reasonable for Deandre Swift targets, 65, 70, 80. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what target number we're going to end up with for Deandre Swift, but he should be amongst like the top five to top eight in terms of targets at the running back position. Now you wish they didn't bring in a guy like Jamal Williams. Cause he's more multifaceted than a lot of the, like if they brought back AP or if they brought in a guy like Jordan Howard or whatever, because they're more like thumpers, they don't really catch passes. Uh, but Jamal Williams is going to take like 30 to 40 targets. And it's not like a huge amount, but it's still enough to to bring Swift ceiling down from like, okay, is he in that Austin Eckler? Is he in that Alvin Kamara range where he can get 100 targets? And this means absolutely not with Jamal Williams. So he's in the tier below that where he can still get 80, 70 targets or whatever and be a, a, and be a really, really good PPR play. The question comes on the ground, right? We know Swift is going to get the work in the air. The question comes like, what happens on the ground? Swift, just like J.K. Dobbins, was awesome on the goal line, okay? Started seeing a lot of the team's goal line carries. How many will Detroit see of those? I mean, probably not a ton. The narrative is that they're going to be a bad team. How many scoring opportunities is is is, is this backfield going to get? But then I look back at last year. I'm like, they also were a five-win team last year, and it was enough for DeAndre Swift to score eight rushing touchdowns. However, the biggest, the biggest red flag to me right now 
the biggest red flag to me right now is Anthony Lynn coming over from the Chargers. And this is what scares me, man. I'm not scared of Jamal Williams as a talent. I'm not even scared of him really contributing on third downs and taking away the targets, right? That does hurt his ceiling a little bit. What I'm scared of is uh, Anthony Lynn going out of his way to call Jamal Williams his A-back call him his big back, his thumper, his guy on third downs, because I'm not sure just how many people, I'm not sure, I'm not sure how aware people are of just how little Anthony Lee, Anthony Lynn used Austin Eckler on the goal line over the last few years. Like we look at Austin Eckler and we're like, he's a great fantasy back. Like we, he, he makes up for it in the receiving department. And I think we're all comparing like DeAndre Swift to Austin Eckler, right? Swift is definitely bigger. He's more of like a workhorse build, but I think we'll see like a similar type role from Swift as we did with Austin Eckler. The problem is Austin Eckler was never fucking used on the goal line. You look at these splits, right? We go back to the 2019 season where Melvin Gordon held out the first four games of the season. Eckler went nuts, right? Was scoring touchdowns left and right. He got five goal line carries in the first four games. When Melvin came back over the next 12 games, Eckler saw a combined four goal line carries. Then you look back at last year, Eckler was obviously banged up, but he saw two goal line carries in the 10 games that he played. This is per PFF, by the way, PFF stats. The other two backs there, Kalen Blage, Josh Kelly. I have no respect for Josh Kelly. That's why I just spelled his fucking name wrong and left it on the chart. Eight and seven goal line carries. So 15 to two from their a backs. Okay. That, that is where I see the problem. Like you could force this in onto Deandre Swift. You could just say he's going to be the goal line back, but we've seen the track record of Anthony Lynn for whatever reason, he really, really, really buys into this a back narrative and it matters on the goal line for his scheme for whatever fucking reason and is going to impact Deandre Swift. So the way I look at it is yes, his ceiling is capped. His floor is nice, but I don't take second round picks for floors. I take them for ceilings. Third round picks, you start to look at a combination of things. You do start to look at the floor. You do start to look at the ceiling. You start to look at the talent. The further you get down the draft board, the more you can risk your picks a little bit, right? You, you need to make sure you hit on your first and second round picks because they're going to be the ones that score the most fantasy points. They're the, they're the ones that anchor your team. So the other ones are more like minuscule picks, right? As you get down the rounds in your fantasy drafts, they matter a little bit less and you could take a few more swings because if they miss the other players getting drafted in that round, your league mates are also taking players that have less likelihood to hit than the first and second round picks. So DeAndre Swift starts to go into the third, fourth round. He's a guy who I will be looking to take there. He's a guy who can go for seven or 800 yards on the ground. I think like people, people love to look at fantasy in such a black and white spectrum. They like to be like, okay, DeAndre Swift, I either hate him or he needs to go for 1400 yards on the ground. Like DeAndre Swift can go for seven or 800 yards on the ground, but also 400, 500 through the air. Right. And that will leave you with somewhere between like 1100, 1200, 1400 yards from scrimmage. Right. And that's the spectrum that we're looking at the range of outcomes for his touchdowns will dictate his finish most likely when it comes to like the fantasy output you know between rb18 down to like rb11 or rb9 or something like that if he does get the goal line work right and he scores double digit touchdowns again that'll be huge that'll move him up the rankings but would anyone really be surprised if deandre swift goes out there and scores six touchdowns like six touchdowns not going to get it done for you, okay? I mean, their line obviously is good enough bringing in uh, Sewell this year with their first round pick. The efficiency should be there for DeAndre Swift, but the volume is going to be the concern, the volume particularly on the goal line, okay? Those are the risk rewards, but as he continues to drop, he continues to be a better and better pick. Second round pick, absolutely not. He's off my board, as we like to say, at BDGE for DeAndre Swift. Let me know what you think about DeAndre Swift. I feel like I'm not in the minority anymore on, on the way I feel about DeAndre Swift. I think most people have come around to the fact that he's a risky, risky, risky early round pick. But third round, he keeps dropping, man. He's a little bit too talented for me to forego for other guys that are just wide receivers or, or tight ends or whatever the fucking case may be. That is my case for DeAndre Swift. Let's move over to the wide receiver five in the sophomore class, according to underdog ADP. And that is Chase Claypool of the Pittsburgh Steelers, currently going off the board 67th overall wide receiver 30. In my humble ass, never wrong, factually correct opinion, Claypool's fantasy production this year is going to be tough to match what people think of him as a talent, you know, if Juju was out of the mix, if Juju did not resign, he'd be much easier to invest in. So I do have a bit of a bit of concern with Chase Claypool when it comes to fantasy football this year. He had an unbelievable first year, amazing first year as a rookie, right? 109 targets, 62 catches, 873 receiving yards, nine touchdowns. He also added two rushing scores. That shit ain't going to happen again. My concern is this. Second year, you'd like to see an increase in volume, right? You, you like to depend a little bit less on touchdowns, right? He had 11 touchdowns. You like to depend a little bit less on touchdowns. You like to depend a little bit more on volume, on targets, on receiving yards, on receptions, on things like that. My my question is, where does the increase in volume come from 
for him to be reliable in scoring more fantasy points for you, right? You can't you can't you can't predict touchdowns on a year to year basis. So I need more volume. They were already number two in pass plays per game last year. Steelers the Steelers averaged. 42 pass attempts per game last year. You don't think of that, right? You think of Ben Roethlisberger, you think of his arm being fucking basically unusable, but they threw the ball so many times last year. So there's no shot that they flirt with 42 pass attempts per game again. Uh, It's the reason they took 225 pound Najee Harris. They want to put the offense on his bike. And I think, I mean, he's going to get 20 carries a game. Like, they, they drafted him in the first round. He's a big back, and they've talked him up nonstop since drafting him. He's going to touch the ball an absurd amount of times this year. It couldn't be more obvious. I mean, when you look at what everyone in the front office at Pittsburgh is saying, right, Art Rooney's coming out saying they want to get more uh, into the run game. They want to get back to the roots of Steeler football, which is a problem for fantasy football if you're looking at the passing offense. So everything points to this being a lot more run heavy. Everything points to Chase Claypool being a very good wide receiver in the NFL. But how high is his ceiling if he scored 11 touchdowns last year? That's what I wanted to ask, right? Sometimes we like to get in the weeds here at at, uh, at Big Dogs, right? Believe it or not, believe all the believe it or not, based on all the bullshit that comes out of my mouth, based on me cursing, based on me just being a fucking a very annoying person. I'm very well aware of that, so I'm sorry. But we like to dive into the stats sometimes. Sometimes we pop an Adderall, and sometimes we get deep into the analytics and the numbers. So I wanted to look like it last year because I'm like, this motherfucker scored a lot of touchdowns. Is it repeatable? What can we expect? Among 71 wide receivers last year that saw at least 60 targets. So there's 71 NFL wide receivers last year that saw at least 60 targets. Claypool was third amongst them in terms of the percentage of his fantasy points that came from touchdowns. 36% of his fantasy points came from touchdowns. Only Mike Evans and Adam Thielen had a higher percentage. Now, you know I've been very vocal about fading Adam Thielen this year because he ranked like 25th in targets, receptions, receiving yards, and then had 14 touchdowns, which is just something that's ridiculous and never going to happen again. So Claypool's up there in the category of like the Adam Thielen where the touchdown regression term that I absolutely fucking hate couldn't be more obvious this year so with you know if the volume is going to stay the same then i could see it happening but with Najee harris coming in and just the the sheer number of pass attempts that they averaged per game last year there's no way it's you know you look at the you look at the volume that claypool had last year you see 109 targets you're like holy shit that is a ridiculous number for a rookie to command you command 109 targets regardless of how you look at it it's an impressive feat as a raw number when you look at the target share on the actual team for the steelers it was 16.7%. So his 109 targets equated to a 16.7% target share. That was 58th among wide receivers. So 110 targets are nice to see, but relative to the team and the passing numbers, 58th among wide receivers last year. It was 7th among rookie wide receivers, okay? So if we're talking about keeping that rate, keeping that target share, maybe going up a little bit, but they do sign, re, uh, they do re-sign Juju. Deontay Johnson's obviously still, still there. Najee Harris is coming in as an actual pass-catching running back, something that they did not have last year, so he takes some of the targets. You know, the volume, if the volume goes down, he doesn't have that high of a share in terms of targets. Like, yes, that number could obviously go up because he didn't play much over the first couple of weeks of the season. He could be more of a, a part of this offense. Very, very much a possibility here. But regardless, I don't see the volume taking that big of a jump. It feels like the touchdown numbers need to be there for Claypool to be good ROI. I would love Claypool if I was a Steelers fan. But if it's not a best ball draft, it's going to be tough for me to invest in a guy like Chase Claypool where you don't, where you need to actually decide which weeks to put him into your lineup, right? So I probably won't be drafting him much in 2020 or 2021 redraft leagues. I'll be drafting him a little bit in, in best ball leagues if he drops to me because obviously he can have very big games. He had a bunch of very big games last year. But I feel like without the volume, it's going to be hard to predict those games. Case in point is that there's, there's a very, very big possibility that I'm just completely overthinking this. But when I look at it, the basic points here are all signs point to this being a much more run-heavy offense than it was last year. Four legit receiving options with the addition of Najee Harris. I don't know. I, I feel like we're in for a little bit of a statistical disappointment from Chase Claypool this year, and that's what I got for you today. Okay? I hope uh, I hope that any of that fucking episode makes sense. I knew that was extremely long-winded. Went on about Action Bronson. We went on about stupid fucking fantasy football strategy for a very, very long time. I don't know. I was just feeling, I was in a weird mood today. As you could see, I got a nice crispy tan, fucking crispy like a chicken finger out here. I think the sun this weekend fried a little bit of my brain, which is why we went down a bunch of weird paths in this episode. But I hope you guys enjoyed it. Next week, Safi Seconds will be, ooh, I think it'll be a good one. I want to say it's uh, J.K. Dobbins and Jerry Judy, maybe. All right, all right, all right, now we talking. Now we talking. So if you want to hear that, if you want to hear the breakdown on those two guys next Tuesday, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Tomorrow, 
We'll be, uh, I don't know what tomorrow is, but we're putting out videos every single fucking day. So just make sure you subscribe regardless. If you enjoyed the video, hit the thumbs up. If you want to watch any of the previous Safi Seconds videos, they will also be linked down below along with anything else I said I was going to link in this video. Tony, you better fucking make sure you tell me what I said I was going to link in the description in this video, okay? Shout out to Tony for the edit. I love y'all. I'm out.